excited you've made it your decision to be here tonight, and I hope you've got a Bible with you. And as you see reflected on the screen before you, I encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 5. As we mentioned this morning, this will be where we take our study tonight. <clears throat> Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. <clears throat> but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. That was about three hours later that his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much, she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at, the feet, at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and bound her up, uh, found her dead and carried her out and buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and on all who heard these things. I want us to go back to the beginning of this story, beginning at verse 1, and notice the first word, and that's the word but. Acts chapter 5 and verse 1 begins with that word but, which is a word of contrast. And the contrast is made between Ananias and Sapphira and their example and the example we had just seen in chapter 4 of Barnabas. The text tells us about Barnabas having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet, verse 37. Then the text says, but, here's a contrast, different than Barnabas, not only in what he did, but the attitude with which he did it. The contrast is that Ananias and Sapphira are quite different from Barnabas. But here is something different than what we've already seen. H. Leo Bowles said this. He said the two illustrations here were intended to be brought in contrast. As the conjunction but introduces the sentence. What a great example Barnabas was. What a poor example Ananias and Sapphira were. In Acts chapter 5, this is a first, at least in the record as recorded in the book of Acts. Don DeWelt said that this chapter opens with the account of the first marks of the evil one within the fold. He's right about that. This is the first case of trouble in the church. Perhaps there was trouble before this. There was someone neglected in the daily distribution. Not major trouble, but there was some distribution problem in Acts chapter 6. A little bit later, but now this is the first time that we come across any kind of real disturbance or trouble in the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 5. It's the first case of church trouble, it's the first record of sin among God's people, and the first case of hypocrisy. And so this is indeed a first. So let's tonight talk about Ananias and Sapphira and list some lessons that we learn from the story of Ananias and Sapphira, which we just read in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. What do we learn from the story of Ananias and Sapphira? There's a lesson to be learned, first of all, about being hypocrites. Because this is the first case of there being hypocrites within the church. And here we have in Acts chapter 5 the case of Ananias and Sapphira being hypocrites. Let's raise the question of what is a hypocrite. What are we talking about when we talk about a hypocrite? Well, W.E. Vines defines the word that is translated hypocrite 
as simply having, I won't read the entire quotation, one who is a stage actor. That is, they would, uh, speaking of, as he mentions here, the custom for Greek and Roman actors to speak in large masks that were mechanical devices augmenting the force of the voice. In other words, it's early form of acting where they put on a front and they put on a veneer, they put on a mask that imitated what they were pretending to be. And thus it became one who was a stage actor, one who is acting a part. A.T. Robertson makes a similar observation that the word translated hypocrisy means to put on a, uh, to take a part upon a stage to act a part and pretend or to feign or to wear a mask to act as a hypocrite or to play a part as he would suggest. And so it's the putting on a front, acting in a way that you're not real, but you're putting on a front or you're acting out a part. That's what the word hypocrisy suggests. Well, that's what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. They tried to appear more benevolent than they were. They said they kept back part of the proceeds. In fact, Peter said you could have done that. That was fine to do that. Not a problem at all with keeping back part of the money that you had, you had sold. You took money uh, from your cell and you kept back part of the price for the land. You did that. But they said they gave it all. They said they were doing more. So they were hypocrites. They were pretending to do more than what they actually did. Moorhead said that people run fearful risk when they profess more than their spiritual strength can carry. I like that quotation. We do run risk when, when we're making profession of greater than what our spiritual strength may carry. You see, in the eyes of men, their action looked good. In the eyes of men, they looked the same as Barnabas did. Barnabas sold his land and he brought the proceeds and laid it at the apostles' feet. They sold their land, they brought their proceeds, and they said, we're giving everything that we gained. And they laid it at the apostles' feet. So in the eyes of men, they looked just as good as Barnabas. They looked just as well as Barnabas. Their concern was only about how they looked in the eyes of men. Jesus rebuked that in Matthew chapter 23 and in verse 28. That you appear righteous unto men, but inside you're full of extortion and excess. That was the rebuke of the Pharisees. They were only concerned about how they looked in the eyes of men. I want to suggest that we learn from this that it's impossible to hide one's sin from God. Let's go back to Acts chapter 5, if you've left that text, and look at verse 5. An important lesson for all the rest to learn, and they did learn that on this occasion, when the case of Ananias and Sapphira were punished for their sin, they learned it's impossible to hide your sin from God. They thinking they're keeping it secret, but look at verse 5. Then an Ananias, fear, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these words. They just heard the words of Peter saying, you, did, you, you were acting as hypocrites. You lied about what you were giving, and God's now going to punish you for that. Look at verse 11, same context. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these words. There was a great impact upon others. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 13. May we all be warned that we can't hide anything from God. Maybe I'm keeping something secret from everyone else, but we can't hide that from God. We learned that lesson right here in this context. Here's something else we learned from Acts chapter 5 in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. We learned some very practical things about being sinners. And the first thing I want you to notice is at verse 3. And that is that Ananias allowed Satan to fill his heart and so did Sapphira. The text says at verse 3 that Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? He yielded to the temptation of Satan. And that's how he allowed Satan to fill his heart. Peter's question in verse 3 shows that Ananias allowed that to happen. It's not that Satan filled his heart contrary to his desire. He didn't want it to, to happen, but Satan filled his heart nonetheless. Go back to verse 3. Why has Satan filled your heart? You allowed that. In other words, why did you allow Satan to fill your heart? Ananias was a free moral agent which means that he conceived this in his own heart. Notice again in verse 4, while it remained, was it not your own? And after his soul, was it not under your own control? And why had you conceived this in your heart? 
So we have to harmonize the expression found in verse 4 with the expression found in verse 3. You conceived it in your heart, but you allowed Satan to fill your heart. And so when we sin, we allow Satan to fill our heart. Have you allowed Satan to fill your heart? Am I allowing Satan to fill my heart? Here's another thing about being sinners. The sin was against God. Look at verse 3 now, the expression that Peter used. He said, why has Satan filled your heart? To lie to the Holy Spirit. Now you lied to men, but you lied to the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 4. He said, you've not lied to men, but you've lied to God. Now their hypocrisy focuses on how they appear before men. That's what their concern was, how they appear before men. But Peter is now calling attention that your sin really is before God. Why did you lie to God? Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? You're not just lying to the apostles, you've lied before God. In fact, every sin is before God. Let's go to the book of Romans, if you will, for a moment. Romans chapter 8, and notice it, verse 7. I'm going to see in Romans chapter 8 that every sin is against God. There may be a sin that's against someone else. I may be sinning against you, but not all sin is against you, but every sin is against God. Look at verse 7. Because the carnal mind is at enmity against God. That is in contrast to the spiritual mind that we see in the context. The carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Every sin is against God. Here's something else about being sinners. He allowed Satan to fill his heart. The sin was against God. <clears throat> but I want you to notice that they were voluntarily participants in this. Look at verse 4. They were voluntary participants. If you've left Acts 5, let's go back to Acts 5 and notice it, verse 4. While it remained, was it not your own? And after his soul, was it not under your own control? You had a choice in the matter. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied unto men, but unto God. The text tell, would reveal to us that there seemed to be no compulsion to sell. People were voluntarily selling and giving of their funds. There was no pressure to give. There was no man to get to demand to give all or a certain amount. They willingly sold, they willingly gave, and then they pretended that they gave all. And what I'm learning from that is this was their responsibility. They voluntarily participated in their sin. I learned three practical lessons about being sinners from this context. Here's something else I'm learning from the context about being an accomplice to sin. I'm learning a lesson about being an accomplice to sin. And what I want you to notice is that Sapphira acted in collusion with Ananias. Let's go back now to verse 4. Verse 4 tells me the idea was conceived by Ananias. Why have you conceived this in your heart? Satan filled his heart, and, but this was something he conceived in his heart. This was his idea. He's the one that seemed to come up with the plan. But let's go back now to verse 2. That he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it. He comes up with a plan. Let's, we're going to sell the land for so much. We got all of this money. We're going to keep this much for ourselves. But we're going to act like we're giving it all. And she was well aware of that. Now, beginning at verse 2, we'll not read verses 2 through 7, we've already read that, that she was not present when Ananias lied, and he, and he, uh, or he gave the money, and then he lied about it, and then he died because of the, pro, uh, the pronouncement of God. But here's what she did beginning at verse 8. Drop down to verse 8. She persists in covering the matter. She doesn't know that he's died. He doesn't know what's going on. She wasn't there when he fell dead. But she comes walking in now at verse 8. And Peter said, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And her answer was, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, then why have you agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door and they'll carry you out. In other words, she was still just as guilty as he was, though it wasn't her idea. She was merely an accomplice to the crime. Here's something I'm learning from that. I'm learning from that that we can be an accomplice to the sin of other people. It may not be my idea. It may not be I'm the one participant. I may not be the one who's directly involved. I may not be the one who directly lied about that. Or whatever the case may be, but I could be an accomplice to sin. How so? I might be in fellowship with false teachers. 
Let's go to 2 John, verses 9 through 11. We often talk about verse 9. We forget about, I think, some of the things that are mentioned in 2 John, verses 10 and 11. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. In other words, you practice something contrary to the will of God, not authorized in the doctrine of Christ. We no longer have fellowship with God. But he who abides in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. We have fellowship with God, the Father, and with his Son. Now, what's the problem? Well, verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, here's the false teacher, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. It might be I'm having fellowship with false teachers. I might be encouraging. I might not teach the doctrine, but I'm encouraging them by having my fellowship with them. I become an accomplice to their sin, verse 11 said. It might be having fellowship with erroneous practices. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5 and in verse 11. Here's an interesting statement found over in Psalm 10. Let's turn to the, uh, Psalm 50 rather. Not Psalm 10, but Psalm 50. Look at Psalm 50 beginning at verse 16. Uh, this is God's dealing with the wicked, but nonetheless, it might be that I consent by saying nothing about what's going on. There may be something that's going on that's wrong, but I consent to it, but I don't say anything about it. I don't condemn it. I may not say I'm in agreement, I may not encourage it, but I just consent to that. That seems to be what the psalmist is talking about. Look at the beginning at verse 16. But to the wicked, God said, what right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant from your mouth, seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him. Doesn't mean they encouraged him. Doesn't mean they said you're doing the right thing. They just don't say anything. Is that us? Maybe it's our own children. What we see them do, but we say nothing. Maybe our parents, we see them do and we say nothing. It may be other brethren, we see them do things and we say nothing. We might be an accomplice to the sin. It might be by tempting or advising or even encouraging someone to do what's wrong. It wasn't that the Proverbs chapter 1? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. We'll forget about Psalm 1 just for the moment. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1 beginning at verse 10. He said, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Well, what are they going to say? Well, they may say things like, verse 11, come with us and let us lie and wait to shed blood. Let us lurk secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like shield. We'll find all pre- kinds of precious possessions. In other words, they give you every reason why you ought to participate in sin. They're encouraging that. Maybe I'm the one encouraging someone to do that. Or it may be by failing to train the child. While you're in the book of Proverbs, let's stay there and go to the 29th division and look at verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but the child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Maybe it's by my lack of training, my lack of discipline, my lack of molding and shaping that I become an accomplice to the sin. There is a story told that seeing a boy misbehave in the street, that Plato went to the boy's dad and began beating the dad. And when asked why he did that, he explained concerning the dad that he either learned it from you or you failed to correct him, recognizing he was an accomplice to the sin. Here's another lesson I learned from Ananias and Sapphira. I learned a lesson about being men pleasers. I'll learn a lesson about being men pleasers. Here was a couple who had a desire for the praises of men that seemed to be their driving force. Let's go back to Acts 5. Perhaps you're still in Proverbs. So let's jump over back to the book of Acts, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. And see if you don't see that the driving force was they wanted to be men pleasers. They wanted the praise of men. Because verse 1 said, or verse 2 said, they kept back part of the proceeds, his wife being aware of it, and they brought their, their proceeds and gave them. In other words, they're wanting the praise. I mean, they want the same kind of praise that Barnabas perhaps had received. Maybe more correctly, it was actually greed coupled with the desire to please men. What a contrast we have to Barnabas. Let's go back to chapter 4, look at verse 36 and 37. Barnabas sought the praise of God. 
Barnabas was the man who was called the son of encouragement. Having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now the word seeking the praise of God is not found in that text, but he's doing exactly, because he's not rebuked for giving part of it, and it's saying he's giving all. He's interested in making a great sacrifice. He's interested in pleasing God. He's not interested in pleasing men. But Ananias and Sapphira, chapter 8, 5, verses 1 through 11, seem to be only interested in what men may think of them. They are not too concerned, at least at the first, what God thinks about them. They wanted man to think that they were truly devoted. Now, it matters not only what we do, but why we do that. The motive with which we do that. In other words, they, they gave their money. What, what's their motive? It seems in this context, in that they didn't give all and they lied about that, they're wanting notoriety that Barnabas perhaps had received. I want the same kind of recognition Barnabas had. I want to be recognized as a giver. I want to be recognized as benevolent. I want to be recognized as devoted, just like everyone else is devoted. Seeking the praises of men. How could it be that we're doing the very same kind of thing? Let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 1. As you're turning there, may I suggest that one of the ways we may do that is telling people what they want to hear. Rather than telling them the truth of the gospel, we may tell them what they want to hear. Paul said, do I persuade men or God? Am I in the business of trying to please men with my preaching or am I in the business of trying to please God? Do I seek to please men? If I still please men, I would not be the bondservant of Christ. He said, I'm trying to be a servant of the Lord and if I tried to preach to please men, I wouldn't be a servant of the Lord. Are we telling people what they want to hear? What we think they like to hear? Or maybe by not telling them what they need to hear. Let's go back to the book of Ezekiel. You remember in the book of Ezekiel chapter 3 beginning at verse 16, God had told Ezekiel, I want you to go preach to the people. Now we'll get to this in our studies on the prophets a little bit later. But I want you to notice that God told him that when you say to the wicked, verse 18, you shall surely die and you give him no warning. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die and you give him no warning, nor speak the warning to the wicked to turn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, <clears throat> then I will require his blood at your hand. In other words, if you fail to do the job, I'm trying to tell you, Ezekiel, that the, I'm telling you the people are going to die and they're going to sin and they're going to suffer consequences. And if you fail to tell them that, then I'm going to hold you accountable. Maybe one of the ways in which I could be a man pleaser is not telling them what they really need. Or maybe by being more concerned about how I look before men than I look before God. Go to 1 Peter. You say, well, what, what would that encompass? What <clears throat> might <clears throat> that include? Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter focuses in 1 Peter chapter 3 where our outward adorning should not be our emphasis but our inward adorning. In other words, the heart. Notice beginning in verse 3. Not let your, <coughs> your, your adornment be merely outward, the arranging of the hair, the putting on of gold, or putting on of fine apparel, but rather the hidden person of the heart. What's the point? We'll get back to verse 4 in a moment. He's saying don't let the emphasis be on how you appear unto men, the outward person, the physical attraction. But let it be, back to verse 4, the hidden person of the heart with an incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. Make sure your emphasis is on the inward adorning. Another way we might do that is by compromising with our friends. I'm interested in pleasing them more than I am in pleasing God. Or it may be that I'm more concerned about making family happy than I am serving God. My family's putting pressure, but God says this, and I'm interested in pleasing family more than serving God. God. Here's another thing that I learned from Ananias and Sapphira. I learned a lesson about being a holdout. What do, you mean, what do we mean by being a holdout? They pretended to be doing more than what they were doing. Well, that's hypocrisy, as we've already talked about. But they said they were giving all, but they only gave some. They were holding some back. Nothing wrong with holding back within itself, but they were pretending they were giving all. They held back but gave the impression they were doing their best. We're doing the best we can do. We're giving everything we gave, that we earned from ourselves. We're doing just like Barnabas did. We're giving everything we can, and they weren't giving everything they could. I want to ask the question, how could we be holding back? Like what Harkwriter said, he said, we too may be pretending with a few outward deeds to be giving the Lord the best we have. 
when in reality we're holding back. Could that be? Could I be saying, Lord, I'm giving you everything I can give you, but I'm holding a whole lot back for myself. That's what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. They were holding back. They could have given more, but they were holding back. And they were not giving the best. Maybe it's with worship. Maybe in my worship I leave the impression that, that I come all I can, and yet I may be holding back. I, I, I'm doing the best I can do. I can't, I can't come anymore. I can't do anymore, but I'm doing the best I can do. Maybe I'm holding back. Maybe I'm holding back a sizable portion. Or maybe when it comes to giving, not just money, maybe my time or my service, that I don't have really any, I don't have any time to give to the service of the Lord. I really don't have any money when maybe I could give more than what I'm giving. Or maybe I say I can't. I'm afraid. Like the one talent man in Matthew chapter 25. Or maybe I say I'm too busy. I don't have the time. I have work to do. Or maybe let someone else do that. I could give more, I could do more, I could participate more, I might be a holdout, much like Ananias and Sapphira. One last thing in the lesson is yours. Let's talk about being disciplined. I'll learn a lesson about being disciplined in this context. This is a case of church discipline, though it doesn't involve withdrawing. It's not church discipline as per 1 Corinthians 5 or 2 Thessalonians 3, but it is a case where sin was dealt with. Some of the same results were obtained. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5 to get a picture of withdrawing and what that was to accomplish. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 5. Deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now notice at verse 6, your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lot? I just learned two things about the purpose of discipline, church discipline, withdrawing. And one of those, verse 5 says, to save the erring. Verse 6 says, you purify the church. Now, both of those were accomplished in this context, though it was not a case of withdrawing. But it is a case where someone was disciplined. The church was purified. And secondly, it was cleansed of its hypocrisy. How was it purified? Well, here was the fact, first of all, the people feared. Let's go back to Acts chapter 5, if you've left that. Let's go back to Acts chapter 5 where our text is found and look at verse 5. That verse 5 says that Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. He fell down dead. People heard the words of Peter rebuking him and then he fell down dead. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Well, there's no wonder. There's no wonder. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. After she died as well, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Can you imagine as the word spread to those that were not present? Did you hear what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? They lied about what they gave. Well, what happened to him? He fell down dead. And then a little bit later, she lied and she fell down dead. And fear then spreads out throughout the church. The people feared. They learned this. They learned that sin will not be tolerated. That was a lesson to learn. That's one reason great fear spread. They learned that God is not one with whom men can trifle. They learned that lesson quite well. It stirred the rest of them to sincerity of action so that they began to think, you know what, when I get ready to give, I'm not going to lie about what I gave. I'm not going to hold back and say I'm giving it all. I'm not going to act like a hypocrite. Look what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Cause the respect of the community. Now let's drop down finally to verse 13 and 14 to finish our study. That not only did it cause the rest of the church to fear, it cleansed the church of its hypocrisy. So there, there was discipline in that sense. But look at verse 13 and 14. After we just finished it, verse 11, now verse 13 says, And yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitude of both men and women. Sometimes think, you know, if, 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 if the world found out we were practicing discipline, it'd turn them away. It very well may be when they find out we're practicing discipline, it may attract them and they may be interested in following the Lord themselves. It did here. It had a great impact upon the community. What have you learned from the case of Ananias and Sapphira? Here are six things that we learned, very simple, practical lessons we learned. We learned a lesson about being hypocrites. We learned something about being sinners. In fact, three different things about being sinners. We learn about something about being an accomplice. 
as Sapphira was. We learned something about being men pleasers and being a holdout and being disciplined. Some very practical things we learned from the case of Ananias and Sapphira. There may be one more present this evening who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come this evening believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?